In this video, we'll be walking through the code of Dreamflight VTOL to help familiarize you with how it works and how you can modify it for your application. At the end of this, you should be relatively familiar with the code structure and, and the processes required for a flight controller to work correctly. I'll cover the basics for first time setup and point out some of the things you should care about. And finally, you'll be able to understand what options there are for customization within the code. Before we start, I just wanted to point out some things about this flight controller. Dreamflight is not state-of-the-art in high-performance multi-rotor stabilization. If you want to fly a racing drone, Betaflight is probably more appropriate. If you want something that has been more heavily developed and widely used, ArduPilot might be more appropriate. But with the maturity of ArduPilot or Betaflight comes the disadvantage of it being very difficult to learn and modify for someone who doesn't have much coding experience. Dreamflight VTOL is meant to be a bare-bones flight stabilization system designed to give you the most flexibility in, in implementing your own code. I wrote this code so anyone with minimal coding experience can get it working very quickly and even be able to easily customize the code itself. You won't see any complicated data structures or classes, just simple variables and functions to keep it as simple to understand as possible. I understand that some people more proficient in coding won't like this, but I can assure you that it's much friendlier to newcomers this way. This video is merely a supplement to the main Dreamflight VTOL documentation, available with the code on GitHub. I highly recommend reading through the documentation to get a more detailed and comprehensive understanding. Everything is done within the Arduino environment and code is written in C using only the most basic functionality to make it simple to understand. So what exactly is a flight controller doing? Anyone who has built an RC aircraft understands that a basic receiver on the vehicle is used to give commands to the motors and servos in order to get the aircraft to do what the pilot wants. For something that's passively stable like an airplane, that's all you need to fly. But for something unstable, like a hovering multirotor, you'll need a flight controller. The flight controller comes in between the receiver and actuators and runs some code in order to stabilize the actuator outputs. This allows the pilot to command a desired angle or angular rate, and the vehicle will perform that command. This video will dig deeper into the code that allows Dreamflight VTOL to do that. So let's take a quick look at the processes required within a flight controller loop to stabilize an unstable vehicle. The first thing that needs to happen in the code is to retrieve the IMU data. The IMU will give measurements of the vehicle rotation rates and acceleration in each axis. This data must be combined in order to accurately estimate the absolute orientation or body angles in space. Dreamflight uses an algorithm known as the Madrick filter to achieve this, giving roll, pitch, and yaw angles of the flight controller. The next thing to do is to get the desired vehicle set point from the radio receiver. In the code, the raw receiver commands are converted into desired angles or angular rates for the roll, pitch, and yaw axes that we would like the flight controller to track. Next, a PID controller is used to actually compute a stabilized output based on the measured state of the flight controller and the desired state provided by the pilot. There are a few controller types implemented within the Dreamflight VTOL code that we'll briefly talk about later. After this, the stabilized output from the controller can be assigned to the actuators. This process is referred to as control mixing where a motor or servo is essentially told how to react to changes in the vehicle's orientation. Then these commands are finally sent to the actuator output pins on the flight controller, leading the vehicle to respond. Then we repeat this process over 2,000 times per second over and over again, creating a feedback loop. So now that we understand the required processes, let's take a closer look at the actual Dreamflight VTOL code. As mentioned before, Dreamflight uses the Arduino environment to make it easy to change and upload code to the flight controller. There are two main components in the Arduino code to be aware of. The void setup is a section of the code that is run one time on startup. We'll use this code to do things like initialize communication with the receiver and IMU. The void loop is where we actually implement the flight controller loop we just discussed. Within the main Dreamflight VTOL script, you'll find quite a bit of code, so let's take a high level look at the contents. I encourage you to pause the video and scroll down the Arduino script to identify these areas of the code as we talk about them. At the top is just a bunch of comments and credits, which is not really code at all. Next, you'll find some user-specified defines, which are just used to specify what receiver and IMU type you're using. The next thing of interest is the user-specified variable declaration section, where there are a lot of tunable parameters pertaining to the controller gains. After that, we define all of the pin inputs and outputs for the microcontroller in the pin declaration section. And then there's a section for global variable declaration, where any variables used in the code are declared ahead of the void setup and void loop sections of the code. Again, the void setup and the void loop sections are where code is actually executed. At the end, all of the functions called within the void setup and void loop are present. A function can be thought of as a block of code that, when called, is executed. They're used to segment the code into smaller, more focused sections. 
In the user specified define section, you'll need to specify your radio and IMU type. The code currently supports PWM, PPM, and SBUS type receivers, and the MPU6050 and MPU9250 IMUs. The MPU6050 is recommended as additional care is needed to implement the 9250 as discussed in the Dreamflight documentation. You also have the option of specifying the sensitivity of the IMU readings. The default ranges are the smallest but most precise, however you may want to use a higher range for more aggressive flying. The user specified variables are the most important for general setup. First you'll find the radio failsafe values which are used if the receiver becomes disconnected from the microcontroller. These values are highly recommended defaults. There are also some filter parameters that can be tuned but they shouldn't be modified unless you really know what you're doing. The next parameters you'll see are the max roll, pitch, and yaw variables which specify the maximum angle or angular rates that can be commanded depending on the controller type used in the void loop. After that, you'll see the controller PID gains which should be tuned for each vehicle. There's a set of gains for each axis as well as for the different controller types depending on if they're stabilizing on angle or angular rate set points. Next up in the code is the pin declaration section. These assignments correspond to the recommended default hardware setup but can be changed accordingly for custom hardware setups. Consult the documentation for tips on changing these if you need to. Next, all of the global variables are defined. These variables can be used and accessed anywhere in the void setup or void loop, so they're referred to as global. You can define a variable within a function as well, but every time that function is called, the variable will be redefined to its default value. You also cannot access it outside of that function, so it's referred to as local. Note that each variable is defined with a variable type, for example, a float or an int. A float is a number that can be negative and can be a decimal. An int can be negative, but cannot contain a decimal. Keep this in mind when you add any of your own variables. Now we've finally gotten to the void setup section of the code. This is a list of the functions and processes that are called here, remembering that the void setup runs only once on startup. I recommend pausing the video and scrolling through the void setup to see all of these things in the code itself, and to read a little more about what each one of them does here. Finally, we get to the void loop where the main flight controller code is run continuously. We'll go through this in more detail to cover each of these functions individually, where I'll show what each function does, what variables are created or modified, and the expected values for those variables. At the end of the code where all of the functions are located, each one has a detailed description at the beginning to explain what it does as well. A quick note about how the code fundamentally works. Now that we're talking about the void loop, this code is run again and again continuously. Variables that we've defined are updated each loop iteration when any line of code modifying them is run. So if we have a variable x that starts at zero, and we run this line of code in the void loop, x will increase to a value of one. The code will then loop back to the beginning and execute this line again, increasing to two, and so on. Each function that is run in the void loop for the flight controller is meant to update variables to their most current value, all depending on measurements from the IMU and inputs from the receiver. At the top of the void loop, you'll see some lines of code that pertain to the timing of the loop. Then we see a simple function used to blink the onboard LED to indicate that we are in the main loop. After that, we get to a bunch of functions that can be used to print variable data to the Arduino serial monitor. Each of these prints at 100 Hz and can be individually used to check values of the described variables for setup and troubleshooting. The next function that is called in the void loop is the get IMU data function. This function retrieves and updates the gyro and accelerometer measurement variables. If you need these values for a calculation, you can use them, but do not modify them. Also note that these values are slightly pre-processed with a low-pass filter to reduce high-frequency noise. Feel free to look at the function's code to see how all of this works. Next, we call the magic function, which takes the IMU measurement variables and updates the roll IMU, pitch IMU, and yaw IMU variables. These are absolute measurements of the flight controller's orientation in degrees. Again, you may use these variables in any line of code you write, but they should not be modified outside of the magic function. Then we call the get desired state function, which takes the radio receiver PWM commands, which range from values of 1000 to 2000, and converts them to desired states of the flight controller. If you're confused about where these channel 1, 2, 3, etc. PWM variables come from, don't worry. They're updated later in the void loop, so we are actually using values from the previous loop iteration here. The throttle desired variable updated by this function is normalized to a value of 0 to 1, which can later be used in the control mixer, whereas the roll desired, pitch desired, and yaw desired variables will range in value depending on the max roll, pitch, and yaw variables defined in the user specified variable section of the code.
This function also generates the roll pass-through, pitch pass-through, and yaw pass-through variables, which can be directly used in the control mixer detailed later. Next, we run the PID controller function. There are currently three options for controller types, and only one can be called at a time. I'll cover the differences in these controllers and how to tune them in a separate video. The most important ones are angle and rate, which stabilize on angle set point and angular rate set point respectively. Regardless of the selected controller type, the yaw axis is always stabilized on an angular rate set point. These controllers use the variables from the IMU measurements and the pilot set points to generate stabilized commands, roll PID, pitch PID, and yaw PID. These variables are used later in the control mixer. Like I mentioned, you can only use one controller type at a time, but this doesn't stop you from changing between them in flight. Here I've set up a simple conditional statement monitoring the channel 6 PWM variable to toggle between an angle controller and the rate controller. I also modify the max roll, pitch, and yaw variables each time I change so that I can have different maximum angles or rates commanded depending on the current controller type. This is just a quick example of how you can modify the code to do what you want. Next we get to the control mixer, which is where there's a bit of customization required for your vehicle configuration. You'll need to specify the assignments to the M1 to 6 command scaled and S1 to 7 command scaled variables. I'll talk more on how to do this on the next few slides, but these output variables will ultimately all be within the range of 0 to 1. A value of 0 corresponds to 0 throttle for a motor, and a value of 0 0.5 assigned to any of these variables is the center, which will center a servo, for example. This is a list of variables that we've seen before that you can assign to the motor and servo command scaled variables within the control mixer. The throttle desired variable is just direct throttle control scaled from zero to one. Unstabilized variables roll, pitch, and yaw pass through have values between negative 0.5 and 0.5 and correspond to direct unstabilized commands from the receiver. The roll, pitch, and yaw PID variables are generated by the controller and generally will have values between negative one and one when the controller gains are tuned properly. You can also simply assign any float value between zero and one to a servo or motor output, for example, to set a servo to a fixed position or to be used to trim a servo alongside other assignments. Here's an example of code you might see in the control mixer function. Here, the stabilized assignments are made to the motor command scaled variables for a quadcopter. Unused variables can just be set to zero. Let's take a look at just one of the motor command scaled variables in detail. We can see that it has direct throttle control and then a combination of roll, pitch, and yaw PID variables which are stabilized from the selected PID controller. The signs, either positive or negative, are determined by the way that the motor reacts to movement of the IMU and may need to be flipped if it's trying to stabilize in the wrong direction. With this assignment, the M1 command scaled variable should correctly have a value between 0 and 1, which is very important for these variables. Here we'll consider a servo in the control mixer that has different assignments for different flight modes. The flight mode in this example is determined by the value of the channel 6 PWM variable, which will have a value anywhere between 1000 and 2000. For our hover configuration, we arbitrarily decided this servo should be stabilized based on roll movement with the roll PID variable. In forward flight, it uses the unstabilized yaw pass-through variable. Note that the sign can change depending on the desired deflection direction. Also note how we've added an offset of 0.5 to center the servo. This is not needed for motors. And just a quick tip is to draw up a diagram of your aircraft to denote which actuator is what within the code. This will help you in making those mixing assignments later so that you know what variable corresponds to what actuator on your vehicle. It'll also help troubleshoot if an actuator is moving in the wrong direction or needs some trim added to it. Next up in the void loop after the control mixer, we call the scale commands function which takes those motor and servo command scaled variables and uses them to update the motor and servo command PWM variables. These new variables are simply scaled to an appropriate range so that they can be written out to the corresponding microcontroller pins. Next we call the throttle cut function which is intentionally done right before writing the commands out to the actuator pins as a last check for safety. The radio receiver channel 5 variable is used to set the motor command PWM variables to a minimum value if it's above a value of 1500. This prevents the motors from spinning unless channel 5 is below a value of 1500, as allowed by the pilot. Then we can finally write out the motor and servo command PWM variables to their respective actuator pins on the microcontroller. The command motors function is used to command the motor variables to the motor pins using OneShot 125 protocol whereas we simply use a servo.write call to write the servo variables to the servo pins.
We then actually update the commands from the radio receiver, which will be used in the next loop iteration. Channel 1 to 6 PWM variables have a value between 1000 and 2000. You'll remember from the throttle cut function that we use channel 5 to arm and disarm the motors, leaving channel 6 as a free auxiliary channel, which can be used to switch between many different things in the code, like controller types or control mixing configurations. The failsafe function is called after the get commands function just to check that the retrieve radio commands are valid. If they're not, then all of the channel 1 to 6 PWM variables are set to failsafe values, which are defined in the user specified variable section of the code. Finally, the last function in the void loop is the loop rate function, which is used to regulate the speed of the flight control loop to 2000 Hz. This is needed because each loop iteration will take a slightly different amount of time to complete. Having a constant loop rate is important to keep filters and other processes in the flight controller loop stable. It also gives us a lot of unused computation power to add things to the void loop without worrying about slowing it down below 2000 Hz. Again, all of these functions we've just talked about are called in the void loop. You can find each of them at the end of the Arduino script to see the actual code for each. A simple way to navigate the script to find a function you're looking for is to use Ctrl and F on your keyboard to search the script for a keyword. So we just covered a lot having to do with the complete code, but you may be wondering what you should actually care about. So let me cover some of the things you will probably be interested in as a summary. This is a list of all of the data from the IMU that could be of interest. For example, for your own data logging, or if you'd like to write your own controller function. You may freely access these anywhere in the code, but since they are measurements, you shouldn't try to modify them. The max roll, pitch, and yaw variables will be of interest to set your maximum angle or angular rates for the controller. You can modify these in the user specified variable section or anywhere else in the void loop. You'll need to select one and only one controller type at a time. Using a simple if statement monitoring the extra channel 6 variable, we can toggle between controller types. I like to change my maximum desired values right where I change my controller type just so I know I'll have the appropriate control authority for an angle or rate controller. The control mixer function is where you'll probably spend most of your time configuring the code. This is where assignments are made to the motor and servo command scaled variables according to the configuration of your aircraft. This is a list of variables you can assign in the control mixer for either unstabilized control or stabilized control corresponding to each axis. You must add whatever combination of these that are required to effectively fly the aircraft. For example, an Elevon control surface will require both roll and pitch assignments, either unstabilized or stabilized depending on the requirements. You can assign custom values to the command scaled variables. For example, a trim variable is created and then assigned to the S1 command scaled variable. This trim variable should be defined outside of the control mixer in the user specified variable section of the code if it needs to be global i.e. if it's being modified anywhere else in the code. The command scaled variables in the control mixer can get any combination of assignments required. This motor is getting direct throttle control and then stabilized pitch control. Note that the pitch PID variable is multiplied by 0.3 to reduce its effectiveness for this case. The sign of these assignments is determined by the direction the actuator is trying to stabilize. For example, if the direction is incorrect, then the sign needs to be reversed. In the control mixer, you can make different assignments for different flight modes. This example uses a simple binary assignment based on the value of the radio receiver channel 6 variable, but I'll cover some more advanced control mixing techniques in another video with a complete vehicle, and I'll show some ways to cleanly fade between these flight modes as well. Meanwhile, there's more information on how to do this in the Dreamflight VTOL documentation. The throttle cut function is used to arm and disarm the motors based on the state of the radio receiver channel 5 variable. The default setup sets motor command PWM variables to their minimum value when channel 5 PWM is above 1500. If you're using a servo variable to command a PWM ESC, then you'll need to uncomment the respective servo command PWM variable here to enable throttle cut. I've seen people that don't like throttle cut on a switch, so they monitor the throttle channel 1 PWM variable to set these variables to a minimum value when channel 1 PWM is below a certain threshold. This frees up an additional auxiliary channel. This is just one example of where you can customize the code to your liking. Finally, there are plenty of printing functions at the beginning of the void loop that can be used to monitor the value of any important variables. You can uncomment any one of these one at a time to check the functionality of the code and verify correct operation after any changes you make. So that brings us to the end of this introduction to the code. I hope you've learned a bit about Dreamflight VTOL and you're now better equipped to make use of the code for your application. Remember that the code is left intentionally minimalistic to give you the most creative freedom possible.
you should now be able to easily customize this flight controller for countless VTOL platforms, and the Arduino environment will make it incredibly easy to add any sensors or other equipment you may want. If you have any questions, feel free to direct them either to me directly or in the RC Group support thread linked in the description of this video. Good luck.